Hey everybody, Justin here with From Zero to Studio, and today we're talking about sample replacing drums, and specifically creating MIDI notes from actual drum audio. Now maybe you want to blend samples in with your own recording, or you might be mixing a song for somebody else and the drums need a little bit of help. In either case, I want to show you my preferred method for creating drum samples from pre-recorded tracks. Let's dive in. So here we are inside the DAW, and if you remember the song from the mix prep video that I did, these are the same drums. And in that video I discussed the issue about the toms specifically in the drums, is that all the toms were on the same track and they were all panned right up the center. So there were four toms in here, and there was no separation. I couldn't have, you know, a rack tom to the left, a floor tom to the right. Everything was just right up the middle. So what I did in that video was I went through and I cut the toms, and I moved them all to their own tracks. But the issue that caused is that this rack tom here and this floor tom down here were together. So when you cut that to move those, that's just a sudden, a sudden stop. So listen to how this rack tom stops. It just cuts. Together it went like this. But there was no panning like you hear in the mix right there. It was right up the center. So I am going to be sample replacing those. And to be able to do that, I need to first create hit points. And I'm going to show you how to do that in Cubase. There's other ways you can do this, like using Trigger by Stephen Slate Drums, and I have used Trigger and used that quite a bit. Uh, but my favorite method is to actually go through and create hit points for each of the notes, and then use a MIDI track and use whichever virtual instrument that I want for these drum sounds. So I'm going to start with my kick, and you'll see that it opened it up to the audio warp segment. For Cubase, I need to go down to the hit points area, and you'll see it put a bunch of hit points in here. So this is a kick, this is a kick, but we have a lot of hit points in between that we don't need. So I'm going to adjust the threshold. And now I'm really only catching the, the peak of that, that transient on that kick. So I'm still going to have to go through and make sure that all these kicks have the proper hit points and that there's no additional hit points in between. In Cubase, you can toggle to go right to the next hit point, and I'm doing that by hitting Option N on the Mac. All right, so I've gone through and I've verified that all the hit points are right on each kick hit, and there was nothing in between. So what I'm going to do next is go back to the top into that first hit point. I'm going to zoom all the way in. And as you saw before, that's right at the start of that kick hit. So I'm going to go through and I'll make sure that all of these are right at the start of each kick hit and that nothing needs to be nudged over a little bit. So you can see that this hit point right here is not perfectly aligned with the kick. It's a little bit too far to the left. And this happens sometimes, especially if you have live drums with other bleed going on. So I'm going to nudge this over a little bit and line it perfectly up with that kick. And you have to make sure that the edit hit points button with the little arrow there is enabled. So there we are, that's our last kick hit. Maybe 60% of the time or so it was accurate, and I had to manually adjust some of the other hit points throughout there. And the reason I wanted to make sure those are perfectly aligned with the kick drum is that if I'm blending a sample in here, I want to make sure there's no flamminess or no phase cancellation or anything going on between these kick drum hits. I also do that pretty quickly uh, using the option in end function to go to the next hit point. It automatically scrolls every time I hit that. So I'm probably going about four, four kick hits per second, um, and I can visually see when one is off. So if that happens, I just go back to that previous kick hit. If I went past it, I'll make the adjustment and then continue going on. So in total, to do that entire kick track, to go through and make sure that all the hit points were aligned, it maybe took five minutes at max. So now that the kick hit points are done, I'm going to go ahead and do these for the rest of the drums, and then we'll dive into how I turn these hit points into MIDI tracks to be able to blend samples in. All right, so all the hit points are done, and all the hit points are lined up perfectly with their transients. So what I'm going to do next is create MIDI notes from these hit points. That way I can use that MIDI data to use the drum sampler of my choice. So I'm going to add some MIDI tracks. So I'm just going to label these M kick, M snare. That way I see in my track it's the MIDI version of that instrument. All right, so there we go. We got 10 MIDI tracks there. And I don't know if I'm going to use them all. I might not blend samples into everything. And I know definitely the toms, because some of the way they cut off, I'm going to have to replace some of those. Um, and then maybe blend into some of the other stuff. So let's see what we got. And on the kick track, I want to highlight that MIDI kick track. And then we're going to open the actual audio kick. And you can see all of our hit points here. I'm going to go down to MIDI notes. And I want this to be C1. 
And I've got to keep a fixed velocity because I'm going to adjust the velocity as needed. And we'll keep velocity at 100 and 1 16th in length. And let's click OK. And now if we go back to that MIDI track, it automatically created MIDI notes for all of those hits. So if I move the kick drum up to that, you'll see that all these MIDI notes correspond with the actual kick drum hits. And because these kick hits were samples that were sent in, uh, there wasn't really any velocity changes to them, a little bit here and there, um, but they're, they're pretty standard. So I'll go through and I'll make sure that these velocities of my kick hits match the velocity that they had on their audio track. Going on from here, let's take a look at the snare drum. So one thing to note with the snare drum here is that even though these all look like individual hits, some of these could be flams. It's just really hard to tell being this zoomed out, but if you were to zoom in, you'd really be able to see if there were two sticks hitting one right after the other. So what I like to do is go back and listen through the snare drum part, and if there is any flams that are occurring, I'm going to put an additional hit point to capture that other stick hit. Alright, so there were no flams in this song, so last but not least with the snares, I'm going to go back to that first hit point, zoom in super close, and I'm going to go through just like with the kick drum and make sure that each hit point is lining up perfectly with the snare. All right, so that's it for the snare, and let's move down to toms. This is going to go a lot faster because we only have a few tom hits on each track throughout the song. Now on this tom hit, ba bum ba bum You know, it's not catching that second tom hit or that third tom hit because we did adjust that threshold a little bit higher. So let's add those in. And you can see right here, once you see that waveform start to change, that's where that next tom is attacking at. So I'm going to insert the hit point. And I'll actually just do the same right here. All right, so now that the toms are done, let's start looking at the rest of these drum tracks. We got our hi-hat. So the hi-hat is not my favorite hi-hat sound, but I'm going to see how that sounds in the mix with the rest of the track. The ride isn't bad sounding. Um, so definitely the hi-hat, I'm going to make some hit points. The crash was only the single same crash. Um, and there were some parts where it sounded like it was supposed to go left and right, but because that track was sent in with it all condensed down to a mono track, I, I might want to get some extra definition and add some additional cymbal crashes in there. The room tracks were good, so I'm going to go ahead and add some hit points for these hi-hat, and we'll finish up the drums. So there we have it. All of the MIDI data has been created from the hit points of the other drums. So what I would do next is I would go through, and let's take the snare, for example, because there's going to be a lot of velocity changes in here. Most of these hits, like right in here, are all going to be pretty much the same. You know, they're all big cracking hits here. But we'll, we'll look at, like, the second hit is a little bit quieter. So to keep these sounding natural and true to the other drums, you know, I'm going to take that and lower it a little bit. And I would go through on all these hits and do the same thing. You know, once you get to a part, maybe like around here, you can see this da -da 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 on this little snare fill here. If we look back at the regular track, you can see that kind of builds up. Da -da 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 -da. And so I would emulate that same thing inside the MIDI track. So I can just point and drag and get something similar to that. And I would go through and I would really listen to how it's blending with the actual snare. And I would try to recreate those same type of, uh, of response out of the MIDI drums as in the other audio track. So when adjusting those velocities, I'll usually already have some samples loaded up in there. Uh, and I'll get something that's close to maybe what I want. But after you get finished with all your velocity adjustments, you can go through and you can choose a different kick sample, a different snare sample, and just pick whatever fits best in the song. Even once you get further down the line in mixing, you might find that a different kick sample sounds better. And you still have the option to change that because you have the MIDI data right there. But as far as creating hit points and creating MIDI data from those hit points, that's pretty much the basics of it. So there you have it. There's my go-to way for converting drum audio into MIDI data for sampling. There's other ways you can trigger samples too, but having the actual MIDI data gives you the ultimate control to fine tune and craft the sound of your drum samples. I know this was done in Cubase, but whichever recording software you have, most include a feature that will do this. Overall, the idea remains the same of perfectly aligning the MIDI to each hit and tailoring the velocity of each hit to keep it from sounding robotic.
Now, as you're working on improving your recording and mixing skills, if you want a guide that'll walk you through every step of the process from songwriting and recording up through mixing and mastering, you could download the roadmap to a radio ready song. This guide covers the five steps required to take your song from sounding like a demo to sounding pro. And you can download it absolutely free as my gift to you by going to from zero to studio.com slash roadmap or by clicking the link below in the description and you can start improving how you're creating and capturing your music. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing. I'll see you on another video soon.